Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad to meet you on I Can Ask. You know, this Friday because today was our special day. We have this hundred valuable celebration here. So as we know that I Can Ask was Canal World and the Universe, we really did it. This is Alice Zhang from Beijing. I'm a professor at the Peking University. Uh, so yeah, today I will be the moderator to introduce all this process to you. Actually, from uh, I Can Ask, we all know that. You know, uh, this was a start in April 2020, 17th. So till now, this was really happened for the last nine, uh, 99, you know, weeks. We have uh, five continental speakers. We have uh, the uh, professors from uh, 30 countries and regions. We have almost 180, you know, speakers and guests on this stage. Uh, the most you know week. Uh, the most world's week was uh, close to hundred. You know one million. Uh, you know wheels. Uh, audience on that. Till now, we already totally have uh, uh twenty millions. Yeah, twenty five millions from the whole uh, all over the world. To, uh, you know to wheel our I can X tags. So we are so proud of that. So on this stage, in the last two years and two more years, yeah. We have, you know, the people get on this stage to, you know, um, help each other and to organize. First, of course, it's me. I was here 100 weeks. Yeah. So next is Paul. Yeah, he got on the stage for more than 90 weeks. And then we have a Professor Jack Dish. Help us in 2021. Yeah, we have a Martin. Yeah, help us from August last year. We have Len from this January. So all these people get on the stage, you know, the week after next week. So they are moderators. They help to prepare the materials. They do a lot of things. So appreciate to my colleagues on this stage. And today you will see most of them. <coughs> And uh, in the last 100 you know, weeks, uh, more than 100 weeks, we are so proud of that. But today, who is going to be the most lucky one to get to be the 100 you know, the weeks speaker? So, yeah, we have Carrie Kagan, and uh, we have uh, 10 people on the stage, 10 minutes perfect. Five girls and the five boys. So yeah, today is a big panel, and uh, we all have all these people. And our speakers is Carrie Kagan. So uh, Professor Carrie Kagan was from uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I know her was uh, uh, last year's Rose in Science. I remember Carrie gave me very strong impression as Carrie is such a superstar of a. Uh, you know, in the scientists and also has a superstar in the human. She thinks everything in positive. He created uh, the, all these opportunities and the chance for everything. So Carrie today is going to talk about a story for the nanomaterials and uh, for something new all to us. So Carrie, are you ready? I'm yeah, ready. Please. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll share my screen. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Give me one second, there you go. So first, I just want to start by saying uh, it's an honor uh, to be here um, and to be uh, now somehow number 100. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here and to share uh, some of the research and really to be to participate uh, in what's really been an excellent uh, platform for the community. Um, and so um, I'll share a little bit of uh, the science and um, really look forward to uh, you know, participating and, and being a part of all of our celebrations today. So, um, and I'll just start by thanking the, the ICANX organizing committee. I'll say a little bit at the end as well, but, um, uh, but just the opportunity to get to share with you some of our work. So I thought today I would tell um, uh, a story a little bit about colloidal semiconductor nanocrystals, although we love lots of different uh, nanomaterials. And then I would try and uh, uh, tell you a little bit about our thoughts and looking at, you know, unconventional or con conventional uh, uh, applications and devices, as well as starting to look at them for the applications uh, I, uh, as a community in quantum materials and devices as well. And so today, uh, the work that I'll share with you is uh, done in collaboration with the Murray and Bassett's groups at the University of
we develop uh, materials of all sorts of different semiconductor uh, compositions. And so you'll see that, and the one, one of the reasons that, you know, these are, uh, you know, we appreciate these both fundamentally as well as an application is that through the ranges of different uh, sizes and compositions, you can tailor their band gaps. And so you can see that for 2, 6, 3, 5, 4, 6 materials, 1, 3, 6 materials, but really spanning anywhere from the UV and pushing further and further over time out further into the infrared. And so this is a, a nice, uh, I think, depiction from, uh, from the Reese group at, at Grenoble. Um, and quantum dots, you know, as many things we, we work on as scientists throughout our career, one of the things that's amazing to see is also that this is an example of, a, of systems by which, uh, you know, we've seen them commercialized. And so I you know, chose this example from, from our colleagues at, at Samsung, where if you uh, go and shop for a, a television, you can buy a quantum dot based television where you're, you know, that where we appreciate them for their color purity. And this is, continues to be an avenue of exploration uh, for the community. So in talking today, I wanted to start uh, thinking about where, where we've come and what I'll call a sort of unconventional electronic and optoelectronic devices. And um, I won't so, talk so much about the synthesis, but sort of share that, you know, as a community, as I mentioned, we can synthesize lots of different compositions of nanocrystals in various sizes and shapes. Um, but starting with these materials, we like them also because they can be processed by solution-based methods. And so, we talk about them as collo colloids or colloidal quantum dots. And that's because these uh, particles here with their ligand shells allows them to be uh, stabilized in solvents. And so if you look at this example here, this is a vial that contains a dispersion of uh, colloidal quantum dots. This happens to also be cadmium selenide in the ex example. And more and more we think about how do we use these uh, dispersions as inks uh, to make different uh, materials. And today I'm going to focus on the example of, uh, I'm going to start with examples where we look at ensembles of particles. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, some uh, single particle um, uh, examples as well. Although, of course, as a community now for, for years, we both look at, um, you know, and study their single particle as well as their ensemble characteristics. And so I'll start by taking, talking about examples where we look at their assembly. Those assemblies can be sort of disordered or glassy samples of, of particles, or they can be organized uh, examples of particles where they are very, you know, have, uh, and can actually even form crystals of these nanocrystals. And what I'll focus today is how we think about using these in thin film form and integrating them into devices. And for the purpose of sort of bridging sort of fundamentals into applications, I'll, I'll mostly focus today on electronics tell you a little bit of the story about thinking about integrating these materials in the architecture of field effect transistors, both to understand their fundamental transport characteristics, as well as ultimately for translating them to applications, even in the examples here where we learned to do that well enough. This is an example of a four inch diameter piece of plastic, which has uh, different uh, circuit topologies made of these nanocrystals uh, spread across the, the area of the device. And I had the opportunity to work with a number of uh, our, my colleagues in the community um, and uh, in putting together a review. But as we think about the applications in optoelectronics, you can see there are lots of you know, devices and work that's being done in the community to look at you know, their electronic applications, their light emitting applications, um, and their photo sensing or, or uh, uh, applications as well. So I thought I'd start uh, with the, uh, uh, here at the beginning and just showing you, I showed you in a sort of photograph, just all of the colors that you see, even by taking uh, one composition in cadmium selenide and controlling their, their size. Um, and this is uh, from Chris Murray's uh, thesis back when we were students at, at MIT. And you can really bring together this idea of quantum confinement that when the particle diameter is large, uh, for example, and the red here is at 150 angstroms or 15 nanometers. And as you make it smaller and smaller, right, you see that this uh, the effective band gap shifts to the blue. And instead of it looking like a bulk semiconductor with an onset and its absorption, you start to see these discrete absorption resonances that much look much uh, like more atomic-like. So sometimes they've been referred to as artificial atoms. And today, in thinking about looking at their ensembles, I just wanted to 
introduced this, where if you look at the energy versus momentum diagram, if you were had a bulk solid, you'd see these uh, a large, you know, semiconductor. You'd see these the blue E versus K diagrams of the conduction and valence band. But as you make the particles smaller and smaller, and you have fewer atoms and fewer atoms uh, that contribute to forming the energy levels, you start to see these discrete states, as you see here in the absorption spectra. And so you see, you know, different, you know, uh, states that go to higher and higher energy, and these states correspond to what's shown in these green dots here, where you can make these sort of vertical transitions uh, in the absorption. What I'm going to focus on today is now thinking about what happens, what's different, how do we, uh, you know, I like to think about, you know, what's the opportunity uh, to use material, nanomaterials, and what, what's different, what do they uh, afford us that makes them interesting, both fundamentally as well as in applications. So if you look at this example, and I hone in Justin on the lowest energy state, so one of the things that we've been interested is in looking at the interactions uh, between particles as we bring them together in ensemble. Um, and for a number of years uh, uh, past, we looked at things like energy transfer. Today, I'm going to talk more about charge transport. And the idea that if you look at, this is an electron micrograph of a, an ensemble of lead selenide nanocrystals. And if you look at this, as we synthesize these materials, I showed you we had this you know, core or this inorganic core, which is what appears dark in these electron micrographs. And then we have these ligand shells on the outside. And the ligand shells are what shows up as this lighter contrast. And you can see that if you thought about moving charge, these particles are fairly, um, fairly far apart from one another, and they actually don't transport uh, charge very well. Um, and so if you look at their electronic characteristics, you might think that, well, every one of these particles has states here at the, at the bottom of the gap, but we have some, they're not perfect molecules, so it's they, they, we have some inhomogeneous distribution. And so that's what I've represented here for sort of the conduction band of the, of the ensemble and the valence band. And of course, uh, well, the, we have particles, there are semiconductors, there's surfaces that we may or may not have uh, fully passivated. And so what I show here in orange as well is, is an idea that where we think about there being trap states, some of those can be uh, shallow, uh, some of those can be deep uh, that we have in the band gap of the semiconductor. Um, so I'll play, I'll, I'll tell you a little about this as we think about uh, transport in particular. Of course, it's broadly important um, and sort of the origin of also developing core shell materials to sort of manage and passivate these states uh, also as we think about them for, for their luminescence characteristics. But as we think about this, I said, well, it's very hard to move charge between these particles because of these long uh, ligands. And so what's uh, character have been used uh, almost in all uh, electronic and optoelectronic devices that are explored in the community is how do we bring these particles close to one another so that we can move charge from one, from one uh, you know, through an ensemble of particles. And so a very important ingredient in integrating these materials into devices is what we refer to as ligand exchange. The idea that in these small particles, we can swap out one surface chemistry for another ligand. And so in particular today, I'm gonna to focus on ligands that reduce the distance between these particles. Uh, this is an example of one of our favorites, which is thiocyanate, uh, which is a small inorganic uh, compound, but the community has really worked on looking at shorter organic and then even more compact inorganic ligands as a way to bring particles closer together and to get transport in these materials. And so what you can imagine then in looking at their energy, uh, their density of states is that now uh, as we bring them just like atoms, as they come together, they start to couple, we'll see an increase as well as a broadening in the density of states in the conduction and valence band. And again, of course, there may be uh, some, some trap states as well. So this has been a very, this idea of changing the surface chemistry and sort of even after you assemble a, 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 an array of particles, you can actually control them after their deposition through these processes like ligand exchange. So one of the other challenges as we think about uh, semiconductors is that of course we know from our experience with you know, conventional bulk semiconductors that doping is an important ingredient. And I'll say for a long time, I would have argued this has been sort of a grand challenge for the community. How do we dope? Uh, these colloidal nanocrystals that's, you know, you know, different from ones that are grown in the vapor phase and things like that. And so um, there have been a lot of advances in how to dope these materials during synthesis. Um, 
But I want to uh, share with you uh, some different approaches where I'm going to talk about how do you actually dope them post synthesis. And so in conventional bulk semiconductors, we mostly talk or certainly teach the idea that we want that we dope through substitutional doping, right? That you'd see here by the little green uh, ball here that we think about taking out one atom and replacing it with an impurity atom that has a shallow enough uh, donor or acceptor energy that it will share its charge or be ionized to share the charge with the lattice of the semiconductor. And so um, that's what's pro proven a little bit more difficult, uh, not impossible, there's really uh, lots of advances in being able to do that. But today I'm gonna to tell you without being able to intentionally dope, I'll just show you that why it's so important actually to dope the materials when they're uh, nanocrystalline materials. So if I just take an undoped or unintentionally doped, which I'll, I'll say a little bit more uh, about, just a sample of cadmium selenide nanocrystals, and we do this exchange to bring the particles closer together. So this is, an, I'm gonna show you an example where we use thiocyanate to bring the particles closer together. And we put it into the architecture of a field effect transistor. It allows us to study the transport characteristics. So if we look at these uh, devices, you'll find that if we want to measure the current between two electrodes, in this case, I'm showing you an example where the electrodes are aluminum. So they're usually pretty decent for uh, getting charge into and out of some material that's n-type, which is what the cadmium selenide is. Um, and uh, what you'll see is, is that as we modulate the voltage on the gate, we can control the accumulation of electrons in the channel. And what you'll see is that as you looked at the current versus uh, gate voltage characteristics, you see that at positive voltage characteristic of an n-type material, you see there's an increase in the current, but it's not that impressive, right? It's not something you know that, uh, that we would get excited about in, in building devices. Um, in fact, in large part, even in bulk cadmium selenide, it tends to be uh, unintentionally uh, slightly n-type by stoichiometry. It's actually very hard to make cadmium selenide p-type, even in the bulk. But what you look at this, as you re realize, is if we take a look back at the picture that we had for the density of states, you'd look at is that if you didn't have a semiconductor that was, uh, and you had a density of states that looked like this, that if you don't uh, intentionally dope your material, you see that the Fermi energy would be somewhere in the middle of the gap. And in these nanocrystalline materials, we have some often, even when we integrate lots of our materials in, uh, uh, in thin film transistor devices, even the interface can introduce these sort of shallow band tail states. And of course, you can also have deep states within the, in the gap. And as a result, if the Fermi levels here, then we don't have very many carriers in the high density electronic states up here that you'd expect to see good transport. And so if you characterize the mobility in these materials, you'd see something like 0.1 centimeter squared per volt second. And for a long time, the community had, you know, seen mobility certainly less than one centimeter squared per volt second. So it's really as a community, and there are a number of my, uh, you know, colleagues beyond the examples of the work that I'll get to share uh, with you today, um, have really worked on how do we look at this idea of tailoring surface chemistry to bring particles closer together, and also ways to actually look at how do we dope these materials so that we can reach higher mobilities. And that's what I'll show you here is that surface chemistry is really uh, important. And instead of thinking about doping in the core, what if you put uh, atoms or impurities near the surface? So sometimes we refer to this as remote doping. And the opportunity is when you ask, well, what's different about a small particle? It's that the, ad the particle's not so large. And so that if you have if you change the surface chemistry here, it can sort of readily share its electrons with the whole system. Um, and so well, how did we do that? We first did this uh, by replacing the uh, aluminum electrodes with a, a stacked electrodes of indium and gold. And the reason for doing that is actually indium has a very similar work function as aluminum, except that when we uh, mildly anneal the indium, the indium readily diffuses across the channel, which you can see by SIMS measurements, um, but it's also one that's a very, as a low-lying donor in cadmium selenide and very effective, even if you look at the long history of, of literature in polycrystalline cadmium selenide, you'll see that it, it's really good at end-doping the material. So if we dope the material, if you uh, now look, what happens is that we see orders of magnitude increase 
uh, knowing that this is a log scale here on the left, in the, in the current that can be moved through the device. And now this is looking like a pretty respectable looking transistor where instead of having mobilities of 0.1 centimeters squared per volt second, it got about 250 times larger, right? So we see we would, could prepare uh, devices with mobilities of about 25 centimeters squared per volt second. And the way that we think about this is that once you dope the material, right, you add electrons, the Fermi level moves up, and now you have a much higher, uh, you have uh, many more electrons that um, will, will sit in these higher density, higher mobility uh, states so that we can uh, more readily move charge through the material. So we could also study this, um, uh, I'll say a little bit more. There was uh, some literature in polycrystalline uh, uh, cadmium selenide from many, many years ago. So always study the literature. Uh, but we, what we did is we saw that if we, hit the SiO2 surface, which is known to introduce electron traps because of surface hydroxyl groups. This is known in all sorts of carbon-based, oxide-based, you know, all sorts of materials that are, are we make in thin film transistors that they'll tra trap electrons. And so what we did is that we hid the SiO2 under a layer of aluminum oxide, which is known to reduce this um, surface hydroxyl uh, density of hydroxyl groups. And so now if we make the same kinds of devices, it makes the uh, transistor just a little bit better as well. We could see mobilities then at the time of about 27 centimeters squared per volt second, but really a measure that if you if we reduce the density of these trap states, we get more electrons in these higher density, higher mobility states. Um, and I won't mention it uh, because of time too much, but you can, we also did lots of transport measurements as a function of temperature. And we see and live in this regime where people refer to it as being band-like transport. The idea that you can see uh, that the mobility as you go to lower temperature increases and it's not thermally activated like you'd anticipate for, for a hopping mechanism. So in this first example, I gave you an example where we evaporated uh, and literally the, uh, the, a metal that would then give it, uh, serve as a dopant. And we've done this, you know, beyond indium for other metals as well in different, uh, you know, in uh, four, six materials as well. But one of the things in thinking about these as solution processable materials is that we also wanted to develop a solution process by which we could dope these materials. So I thought I would choose this example here, which also emphasizes not only do you dope by introducing what we think about as impurities that we know as sort of donors or acceptors in our studies of conventional semiconductors, but also stoichiometry can be used actually as a way to control uh, the doping concentration. Um, so this is an example of in lead selenide, which is uh, one of the ones we had uh, done uh, this work in earlier, which is, is that if we have an ensemble, if we treat it with a metal salt or a metal cacogenide, in this case, a, a sodium selenide, the selenium will coordinate the surface atoms here and will enrich the surface in selenium. So you can think of this as an ALD process, like an ALD process, that if there are metals on the surface, the selenium will attach. Um, and what happens is, is that selenium is a low-lying acceptor in lead selenide. And so it is effective p-type, p-dopant in the material. And then if you take the same material and you immerse it in lead chloride, uh, the lead, this metal salt, the lead, will then uh, bind to the surface selenium atoms, again, like an ALD process, and enrich it in lead. And lead is a low-lying donor in, um, in lead selenide. So what does that mean? Is that you can see here, if you look at the transistor characteristics, that um, when it's treated with sodium selenide, it's actually, we can make it degenerately p-type. And as we add more and more lead, it becomes less p-type to ambipolar to n-type. And so you can really use these ideas of controlling surface chemistry, whether through evaporative methods, solution-based methods, as a way to control the carrier type and concentration in these thin films of nanocrystal materials. So if you think about those in applications, now we want to really think about not just using the transistor as a platform for transport studies, but starting to think about uh, their interest in the application in electronics. So if you look at uh, this uh, example uh, here, this is um, one of the things that we had noticed in uh, many in our community, we all love our glove box systems where we work in inert environments. Um, 
But of course, eventually when we're building devices, we'd love to get out of the glove box and use some conventional processes. And so one thing that we had noticed is that we would make this device, if you look at the blue curve here, this is an example of a cadmium selenide uh, transistor. You say, oh, it looks like a nice looking transistor. And then we would bring it out and expose it to air. And then the characteristics would look terrible, right? Which is the green curve right here. But one of the things that we noticed is that we could take these devices uh, and re anneal them at mild temperatures and bring the characteristics back. And that's what's shown in here. And that really led us to be able to take these materials and our fabrication processes out of the glove boxes in our, in our research labs and to start thinking about using conventional fabrication techniques or even unconventional fabrication techniques uh, to be able to think about making um, you know, uh, devices over larger area and with smaller channel lengths. So this is an example of a four inch diameter uh, silicon wafer that we started with. You can see here, we can coat fairly uniformly across that diameter, these thin films of, of cadmium selenide. And then what we did is that we um, uh, had a mask where we made 144 transistors uh, across the, across the uh, four inch wafer so that we could characterize uh, the, the uniformity of our devices. And then um, the other thing that is important is that we did this by using photolithography. So this process by which we re anneal allowed us to be able to use you know, solvents, expose it to air, and all of those processes, and still yet to bring back the characteristics. Um, and so what you see uh, here is then, and then we could take these, uh, these uh, uh, wafers and we could actually put them in an ALD process and we could encapsulate them. This is an example where we encapsulate them with aluminum oxide. Um, and in fact, the sort of 100 to 50 degrees for you know, a long time as you grow this ALD layer actually does the same thing as the re-annealing process that we see here. So in fact, you don't have to do it separately. It happens during this encapsulation process. And then this is an example of the kinds of characteristics of the devices that we would achieve, um, which, uh, which are ones that look good. Um, and then we characterize these over the over time as well as over these large areas. And you could see that we could sort of reproducibly uh, have mobilities that were on the order of about you know, 25, 27 centimeters squared per volt second at the time. And uh, we characterize these two as a fun, uh, over time to uh, look and see that we could make devices that were air stable. And that's characterized by both the measuring, we followed a half a dozen devices over a couple months. Um, and you can see that the mobility as well as the threshold voltage of the transistor remains stable. So as we thought about uh, this, the next thing we wanted to do was to think about not fabricating our devices on silicon wafers, but to put them on plastic. And so I just thought I would share with you some of the things that uh, I showed before is that you can, if you can do this and we could take it out of the clean room, we started to uh, work on developing circuits. So this is a four inch piece of plastic, as I mentioned. It's got lots of different analog and digital circuit topologies um, on the surface. This is an example of one. This is a, what's a, a ring oscillator. It has um, 12 transistors, 10 that make up the ring oscillator and two that are part of the buffer to the outside uh, electronics. And the key part here was actually for us to develop the process in building circuits was to be able to develop uh, a via process that was compatible. So actually once the previous work, we really learned how to uh, handle these um, and deposit these thin films and how to dope them and build transistors. So the key, in fact, that we uh, perhaps don't always appreciate is that some of the other components are actually hard to do. So we developed, we did find and identify a process that allowed us to make vias. And I think of vias for anyone who's not a circuit person is, um, is like a staircase between floors of the building, right? That it allows you to control the flow and move, uh, move your electrons, for example, uh, in the various pathways that give us the characteristic of different circuit topologies. And while I won't go into it uh, too much, the idea of looking at uh, these ring oscillators is first is that, you know, they have to have very uniform characteristics across all of the devices in order for the circuit to operate. And so you can see here, this is an example where if the circuits working, you sort of see this ringing or oscillation pattern. Um, and so that's a, a measure of success of being able to sort of make these large area electronics. The other thing that we look at in electronics is, well, we're impatient, right? We want charge to move very quickly. Um, we want our, our circuits to be fast. 
Um, and in these applications where we think about using um, devices on plastic, they could be from mobile devices, wearable devices, right? You don't want a big battery. So we want devices to operate at low voltage. And so if you look at this plot here on the right, you'll see a measure of the delay. So we want the delay to be short because we like things to be fast. So the goal is you want to push down in this, uh, in this metric and you want the voltage to be small for things like portable applications. So you want to push down in this direct direction. And so what I'm showing here was at the time that we did this work uh, that we compared how did these materials stand up to many of the other material systems that are being exp were explored in the community. So the green are organic uh, semiconductors that were used in transistors. Uh, if it's filled in, it means that it's still, uh, it's on a rigid substrate. Um, and if it's open, the symbols, then it means that it's on a flexible uh, substrate. And so you can see that, you know, these nanocrystal materials look good compared to those. And I would say they were competitive in blue and, and in red are examples of carbon nanotube arrays and sol gel um, uh, zinc oxide. So they're an interesting competitive uh, material system, uh, we'd argue, uh, in looking at the applications in flexible electronics. And one of the things that we were interested in, which um, today when we also do lots of work on metal particles um, and, uh, and looking at them for, for optics, for example, but they also make very good conductors. And so what we were interested in doing was saying, gee, if we want to build solution processes and start thinking about these directions in additive manufacturing, for example, can we build the entire transistor using solution processes and out of nanocrystals? So in this example here on the top, only the semiconductor layer was made using solution-based processes. Everything else was done using conventional evaporation. And so what we did is that we looked to uh, work we've done where we can take, for example, silver particles to make good electrical conductors. We use the same kind of surface chemistry to really bring the particles closer together. So we, again, they actually are treated with thiocyanate. Uh, we use cadmium selenide to make the, the thin film. And the two key ingredients in developing this work that we had to really develop at the time was to look at how you make a good nanocrystal based uh, insulator that wasn't leaky to charge. And so what we used was, this is commercial aluminum oxide and we found that we could layer them with polyelectrolytes to make good looking uh, low leakage and high dielectric constant gate insulators. So not always the most sexy thing when someone thinks about, you know, but the insulator is really important to the performance of the device. And the other thing that we worried about is that we didn't want to, for example, evaporate uh, indium. And so at the time, what we used is that we uh, uh, introduced and made indium particles by, again, by um, you know, wet chemical synthetic methods. And so we mixed indium particles that would serve as the source of indium for doping uh, along with uh, the silver particles that form the conductor. And so we mix these and then uh, we could then use the same kind of annealing processes to dope this semiconductor layer. And so again, this is a four inch by four inch piece of plastic with different uh, transistors on the surface. This is a highlight of one. Uh, we patterned these layers um, at the time using uh, lithography, but you could see that using entirely nanocrystalline materials, you could build the source strain gate insulator and semiconductor layer of the transistor and again produce nice looking characteristics uh, using these, um, uh, using uh, just nanocrystal uh, materials. And so I think, I hope it sort of sets a stage for, for what's possible and thinking about uh, looking at applications and, and uh, you know, thinking next about the opportunities in fabrication that come with using nanocrystalline materials. So I wanted to say a little bit about what's next. And I'm going to give sort of two vignettes, right, of, of um, you know, where are some of the challenges in the field and what are the opportunities and even further flexibility that we have in choosing nanocrystalline materials as building blocks to make, uh, you know, uh, different functional materials for devices. So I'm gonna choose two. One is, I'll, I'll say is uh, driven by this uh, interest is that, you know, a lot of the community we worked on 2.6 and 4.6 materials that contain cadmium and lead. And obviously for, for the reasons of, uh, uh, toxicity, there's a concern about replacing those materials and a growing interest in lots of really nice work done in the community of developing other compositions of materials. I'm going to tell you today about 136 materials. We also work on 3.5 materials for this reason. Um, but we had looked at the time at the challenge of how do we 
look at compositions and the 136 materials, you know, even since we've done the work, there's been very nice advances in their synthesis. Um, but if we, as we looked at this, uh, some of the synthesis was a little bit harder to control at the time. And also if you look at many of the um, devices that are made out of it, the mobilities of these 136, I'm gonna tell you about copper indium diselenide in particular, is actually not so high. Uh, so something on the order of 10 to the minus two centimeters squared per volt second. And so one of the other things that's unique about looking at nanocrystalline materials is this process that uh, the Alvisados group taught us about, which is cation exchange. The idea that you can, um, you know, that the materials are small that you can replace one cation, for example, for another. Often that's done in solution uh, as particles are synthesized and certainly a, a fabulous tool that the community has used. One of the things that we were interested in is could we do that in the solid state and take and start with something that we know well. So this is an example again uh, that I showed you before of the four inch diameter uh, silicon wafer coated with nanocrystalline cell, uh, cadmium selenide. That cadmium selenide has already been exchanged with thiocyanate so that particles are really close together. And we knew that we could make high mobility transistors from this. And the question is, is could we start with these materials um, with the caveats that certainly, you know, in the end, uh, we're replacing, we're still starting with cadmium, although the cadmium doesn't in principle would knock it out to the community uh, because it would be used in fabrication. But could we replace these materials and show that we have this sort of versatility to sort of exchange materials in the solid state and also to form this uh, copper indium diselenide. And so my, my student Han uh, started with uh, the cadmium selenide sample and developed a process by he, where he would uh, change the surface chemistry, for example, um, uh, of the materials. He'd bring them close together. He'd uh, swap and introduce uh, selenium uh, here on the, on the surface. Uh, that helped then that we would uh, introduce and swap selenium, uh, sorry, uh, swap the cadmium for copper. And so we could make copper selenide uh, materials. Some of these steps are to control stoichiometry. So then we would, uh, because of what gets, um, you know, some things that may get lost in processes, but we could uh, go through and make, change cadmium selenide to copper selenide. And then when he introduced is something we call a uh, liquid coordination compound, but where we would replace some of the copper with indium using trioctylphosphine indium chloride. And so we could, it became, it's advantageous uh, uh, energetically. Um, and so this is, I won't go into, for any chemist aficionality, you can think about this from hard acid-based uh, theory, but you could partially exchange and be advantageous that you'd extract, the top would extract some of the copper and you'd be favorable to insert indium into the material. And so in doing that, we were able to uh, go and we see we, we could also, some of these steps would actually cause some uh, fusion. So in the end, we would make things that look like 10 nanometer grain size copper indium diselenide. And so I just wanted to sort of share with you that flexibility you could characterize and show as we go through these steps of cadmium to, to copper and then add indium to making copper indium diselenide. You could characterize that by diffraction measurements. So I'll just say that these uh, lines are all characteristic with us going from cadmium selenide that were smaller particles to forming copper selenide to then forming the phase of copper indium diselenide um, that you'd expect uh, with a little bit larger grain size. And as well as here are what you'd expect from the optical characteristics that I, that I won't describe further. But then you could, once you do this, you could really use this kind of same approaches that we had before where you could make uh, transistors uh, these uh, transistors have now mobilities on the order of about 10 centimeters squared per volt second. So this is really where we wanted to show that you could take some of these other compositions that were at the time certainly difficult to synthesize directly and to make into high mobility tin film materials and use these approaches and, and really realize the same kind of high mobilities that we see in other two, six, three, five, and four, six semiconductors. So we did the same kind of uh, processes that I described for cadmium selenide. You could see that, you know, the mobilities were high. We monitored them uh, over time. We could see that they were reasonably stable. And you could go through the same processes of building them into various uh, circuits. This is an example of just a two transistor. So we haven't gotten quite so complex with these where we built an inverter and an inverter works as an amplifier. 
um, and so we could amplify uh, signals uh, in using this, uh, these uh, sort of simple circuit examples. So it sort of sets the stage just to show you some of the flexibility of what's possible. And I'll show you one more that um, I think is very interesting to think about, um, you know, as you know, what other uh, things are possible. This is a little bit more from the fundamental perspective, um, but there uh, has been uh, beautiful work done in the Netherlands as well as um, by the Hanrath group at Cornell, uh, where we really looked at if you take these nanocrystals, and you might have even noticed this on my first slide, but if you change the surface chemistry, particularly for the lead cacogenides, the lead selenide, you can get these particles to come together and really sort of epitaxially fuse. So there's a lot of flexibility in the material to be able to sort of adjust it after you assemble it. Um, so you can see these interconnected networks. This is uh, examples from the Honrath group, uh, sorry, from the, the uh, von Mockelberg group. This is an example from the Honrath group. And the idea behind this is to see if you could even grow the neck. And this was in some nice theory by the Schlafsky group from Minnesota that showed as you uh, really could grow this neck with here, you'd sort of open the channels and increase the transport characteristics uh, that you would see. And that's what um, uh, they showed us in theory. And so there have been studies that showed sort of high mobilities uh, at very uh, small scales. But as you look at larger scale devices, they actually haven't been, they're not yet higher than what we've seen in other, um, uh, you know, randomly organized uh, materials. And so you can imagine that, you know, there are some defects in these that affect ultimately the long scale uh, transport characteristics. And in this work by, by the Honrath group, they also looked at how do you, could you uh, grow material, start with this system here and add material to control and increase the neck width. And the, um, and the answer is it certainly looks like yes, and it's really amazing to see just the epitaxial uh, registry of the uh, columns of atoms that you see here in the electron micrographs. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very interesting platform uh, for study. At the time though in this work, what you see is that once they overgrew the material, then they lost the ability to modulate the transport anymore in looking at the transistor. And so we were very, or as a, as a platform for looking at the transport. And so we were really interested in, could we use some of the uh, approaches of ligand exchange, cation exchange that we had used in other material systems uh, like the 2.6 materials, um, but to see, could we now do this in these epitaxially fused materials? So it's really the flexibility in the lead cacogenides that lets us form these uh, structures. And so what we wanted to do is to start with lead selenide and see whether we could ultimately convert it to cadmium selenide. And the reason was not one here about toxicity and I was much more focused on the fundamental uh, study, but the reason for it is the challenge with studying transport in lead selenide is just that it's a small band gap material. And so it has a high intrinsic carrier concentration. So it's hard to modulate the, uh, the, the current uh, with the gate field. And so what the advantage of cadmium selenide is that it's larger band gap really reduces that intrinsic carrier concentration. And it gives us orders of magnitude uh, more in current modulation for us to really study the transport. So what we did was develop, again, a, in the solid state, a cation exchange process that allowed us to go from lead selenide to cadmium selenide. And in doing this, uh, what, we had, what we wanted to do was not to go directly from lead to cadmium, because that would require higher temperatures, but we went through an intermediate in copper selenide, which really allowed us to make these uh, devices more readily without them delaminating because all of these processes are happening in the solid state. And so I just wanted to show you these examples. If we started with lead selenide, then we could form copper selenide. And then this is the final cadmium selenide. And you can see that we have this sort of epitaxially fused structures. Uh, in this process, we actually grow the neck width a little bit, but you can sort of see the, the organization in the electron micrographs that you could achieve uh, by using this process. And so I know I'm running a little bit short on time. I'll just maybe just show the, the larger area characteristics. Um, we also looked at ALD encapsulation, borrowed from some of our work in indium doping to increase the, uh, con uh, the carrier concentration. Uh, but what we found is, is we ALD encapsulated so that if we infill the structure, uh, even when we anneal, we'd maintain this sort of organization of particles. If you don't ALD encapsulate, you just anneal, um, 
especially since this exchange process forms zinc blend instead of word site materials. They're much more readily uh, uh, fused, and so you could you'd form polycrystalline films. But what we see is that um, if we build these devices, what we see is that by causing this fusion, and maybe I'll just skip to the punchline, is that uh, I'll skip to this punchline here, where ultimately we develop processes where we could dope the materials, we ALD encapsulate them. And what we can see is that by making these epitaxially fused structures, instead of the mobilities that I showed you before in these nanocrystal arrays that were you know, 25, 20 centimeters squared per volt second, we'd now see even higher mobilities of 35 centimeters squared per volt second and things that look much more comparable to what we'd see where we made the uh, corollary uh, polycrystalline material. So it just shows the opportunity really to think about um, you know, controlling the architecture of these assemblies of particles and using them as a way to control of you know, distance, composition, um, and even these ideas of thinking about epitaxy of how to really control the characteristics of these, you know, what I'll consider a fairly versatile uh, set of semiconductors. So I know I'm running out of time. Um, I just want, uh, maybe I'll just show you, uh, 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 sort of skip to uh, just maybe two slides that to tell you about thinking what's next about what, else, you know, as we think about colloidal quantum dots and certainly part of our uh, new IMOD uh, Science and Technology Center is not only the, un, uh, the sort of piece I told you about unconventional or uh, uh, optoelectronics, but it's also to think about quantum optoelectronics. And so we really think about what's the opportunity in quantum dots to make an impact in this area of quantum information science. And so there's been, you know, really beautiful work that's starting to come out. And what we think about is just the opportunity that in a small package with the synthetic control that we have over quantum dots, we can think about, you know, sort of putting all the function of qubits in the quantum dots. And so these are example of, you know, just using the exciton that can be delocalized over the vo uh, volume of the nanocrystal. This is a core shell particle. It's the ones that are used in TVs. We love them for their luminescence. Um, and studies where we're, uh, the community has been looking at them as single photon uh, emitters. Um, and so this is an example um, from the uh, Buendi group. Uh, in looking at uh, single photon emission. These happen to be in the perovskite nanocrystals. But I'll just say that, you know, they really yield very bright, stable, and tunable emitters that make them interesting platforms uh, for, uh, for photon uh, qubits. The other thing that's, um, you know, I think uh, is one that we really look at studying uh, more and more is the opportunity to be able to position defects uh, within the core of these materials. Um, for using them as spin qubits. And this I think is an area of, you know, sort of open uh, opportunities um, where we really think about the quantum dot really serving as a host uh, where we now use the band gap, which we can tune and make bigger with size and use the energy landscape within the band gap to put in other energy centers that were uh, uh, energy levels that can serve at, with the right electronic structure uh, to serve as uh, spin qubits. So think about them as hosts. I'll just say a couple of examples are in thinking about uh, ones that we know in the NV Center in Diamond, uh, which the community uh, working on uh, quantum information science studies a lot. Another example is other ion impurities, such as manganese doped uh, zinc sulfide that you know, our, um, a number of our colleagues in the Norris and Gamlin group have worked on for a long time as well. Um, and I'll just finish it by just saying that, of course, you can also look at um, the assemblies of these materials. So as we get and learn more, we really think about how do you take advantage of integrating these materials uh, into different photonic structures or cavities to use them for their uh, single photon emission? Or can you make, think about them and take advantage of the uh, ability that we have in the community and have developed to make arrays to think about bringing particles with those, uh, for example, spin centers so close to one another that you can start to couple uh, these arrays, uh, in, you know, these uh, uh, qubits in these larger arrays. So one step, and I, uh, I apologize that I'll, I'll just uh, tell you maybe two slides on the punchline of this. So one of the things that we've done that I thought I would share is our recent work on looking at nanodiamonds, which you can are milled and you can make in particle form. I have to admit, uh, having been introduced to my by my colleagues to these materials and having worked on nanocrystals for so long, 
these are the ugliest looking nanocrystals that I've ever seen, right? Where so everything I've showed you before are these nice size and shape controlled particles. Um, but one of the things is we really wanted to see, could we use some of the techniques in assembly to really be able to position these materials? And we've done other work before this and other metals and emitters and stuff like that to position them sort of deterministically and in uh, different structures. And so I'll say that we've used this uh, sort of capillary assembly process where you can see there's this liquid here, it's water with particles assembled them. And as we slide them across the surface, capillary forces drive the particles into a template, which we structure using lithography. And so one of the pieces of work we did recently was to do, try and do this with these nano diamonds. And so you can see sort of large area arrays, and I'm just highlighting a, a small section where we could really, um, in at least sort of 80% or a greater yield, assemble particles, uh, uh, particles into these templates. And so I just wanted to you know, share with you the opportunity in particles and for their assembly processes. And I'll just say that it allowed us to really go through and start doing very statistical studies on the characteristics and differences of different uh, particles to study them uh, for their applications in quantum information, whether we'd see that they would be single photon emitters or have more than one defect, and also to look at their uh, spin lifetimes. And so I know I'm running out of time. I'll just uh, I'll skip this part of all of our characterization, but just you know think that you know it really provides a platform for us to to learn and study uh, experimentally some of these material systems as we sort of bring on the ranges of compositions from ones that you know perhaps we really you know are are already well studied uh, or well known in the example of the NV diamond to really looking at other compositions that might be interesting candidates that the community working on nanocrystals could actually synthesize. Uh, from the bottom up uh, and really add to the, the range of compositions and uh, applications that we could look at for quantum information science. Hi, Karen, you still have five minutes. <laughs> oh, I do, I was rushing. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know how long you wanted me to talk for. Um, so, uh, well, yeah, maybe I'll just say a little bit more then if I can get my slide to go back. Yeah, so I'll just say, then if I have five minutes, I will say a little bit more about some of the things that we had the chance to look at. And this is really uh, the work of uh, uh, Henry Shilovitz, who's a joint student between uh, Lee Bassett and myself. But you can see that I showed you these AFM images of these large arrays of, of, uh, of, of diamonds that we could position. Um, and you can see them also as we mapped in PL uh, with uh, high resolution where you would see emitters. And so then we could go through and look at each site and we could do a number of measurements. And so on this slide, I've just highlighted four measurements that we looked at, uh, sorry, four particles, just to represent the different kinds of characteristics that we'd see from these commercial nanodiamonds. And so one thing that, uh, as we looked at the different characteristics, one thing I'll say is that the PL map shows fewer diamonds than the AFM uh, map because some of the particles are actually optically dark. So the ones that you see here are, are bright, right? They're emitting light. And so we could measure their luminescence spectrum. And from the luminescence spectrum, we could, uh, we could fit uh, these to find um, how much were, you know, how much there are two states, the NV zero and the NV minus state that you see from these nanodiamonds. And so, you can see uh, here in blue is the component of the PL spectrum that's in the NV0 and in the red in the NV minus. And what's important for, to, to recognize is that, so we, uh, is, that, um, is that these diamonds, you can see each one of them looks a little bit different. Um, and so what we did was to characterize these, I'm just showing four here, the next slide is gonna show the summary of 219 of them, um, but we could go through and characterize the charge state uh, and, and um, of these, uh, of these uh, diamonds. Now, the one thing I'll say is that some of these are single emitters, and you can see that here in the correlation measurement, where if it, the cusp here dips below 0.5, we think it's characteristic of just a single emitter, and you can actually uh, calculate the number of emitters from uh, the magnitude at, at zero time, right, that, you know, you don't have, you have no photons that are uh, being received by the detectors at the same time um, because it's a, uh, it's a single photon emitter. So particles where you see that that's not true, right? That you actually have more emitters and N is larger than one. And you could imagine that uh, 
that can come because um, you may have in a particle more than one of these MB centers, right? So the, uh, these are made by you know uh, bringing in 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 nit in, uh, nit in nitrogen and then exposing them to radiation to create the vacancy that makes this nitrogen vacancy center. The other thing that's different is that you could look at how uh, we measured the uh, uh, magnitude of the luminescence as a function of, of power. And so you'd see these characteristic curves where we could look at the magnitude of the power and the power at which they saturate. And so you could imagine if you have more NV centers that you were probing, they were gonna be brighter, right? And so I'll say that that's one of the correlations that we see. And then um, uh, we could also uh, sort of initialize them in, in one state and measure how long the, uh, the spin stayed in that state or what's known as a T1 time after they were initialized. And so if you just look at the kinds of, you know, the examples of particles, we'd find example, you know, what you see in these examples are, are different characteristics that really represent, you know, obviously what's in, in homogeneity in the, in the characteristics of the, of the diamonds. And so we were interested in what we could learn from uh, these since we could now look at more statistically look at many of the diamonds. So we looked at a sample set of 219 of these nano diamonds. Um, and I'll say that uh, um, about 31% of these were, were actually dark. We'd see them in AFM, but they wouldn't show as emitters in the PL. Um, and so then we had 151 uh, bright emitters. Of those, about 12% were single emitters. These characteristics were actually quite consistent with what's um, uh, the, the specifications from the vendor, from Automas. Um, but one of the things that we looked at that you asked, you know, as you do these sort of statistical studies, you know, and we could look at and see that some, the purple here represents the ones that are dark. And then we had a distribution of the ones that, how many centers that there were in the ones that were bright. We could see some distribution in whether they were in more in the negative or the zero uh, state in terms of their charge state. We could measure how that, what, when they were saturated, this is sort of the linear relationship between the number of emitters and their saturation, and we could look at their T1 times. And so in looking at these characteristics, there are a couple of things that um, we, we took away. One is, is this distribution uh, actually didn't, was not consistent with something that's uh, Poissonian and that led us to really look and think back to the fabrication process itself and to see that, um, that it was consistent with the idea that when you form these Diamonds, the nitrogen that's introduced was actually reported and known to be inhomogeneous. Uh, and so we think that you sort of always get this distribution of, of, of dark particles. Uh, in particular, we don't see anything that depends on their size. It looked, some of them were dark. You know, you'd think if it was a bigger particle, statistically, you'd have a center in it. So it really taught us some things about the fabrication process itself. And we also looked at, for example, I'll just highlight one other, which is, you know, doing this correlation measurements a little bit. Uh, um, complicated, but you could, you know, it takes time, complicated, but as you look at the saturation, it correlated with the number of emitters. So possibly you could just measure the saturation to be able to identify where you have a uh, single emitter. So those are a handful of the kinds of, um, you know, takeaways that we learned from the materials, both about the processes, maybe ways that the processes would allow us to, you know, really realize more single emitters or how to control those as we look at the opportunities that, of course, we like single emitters for their integration in quantum information science. So maybe I will stop there and just uh, finish with my uh, conclusion in sort of, you know, sharing and thinking about the opportunities and what's different about colloidal quantum dots and our abilities to look at taking the synthesizing these materials to make, you know, lots of them disperse them in solution to make ensembles of those materials to be able to manipulate those ensembles, both in the sort of structure, right, the assembly architecture, as well as the composition of those materials, uh, and even electronically through processes like ligand exchange, doping, and a cation exchange, that really open the flexibility that we have in nanocrystalline materials to sort of go in and tailor things as we as we want to, uh, even post synthesis. And then to think about all of the ingredients, then to how do we engineer devices that will allow us to, to make larger scale and integrated uh, systems, you know, for different applications where, where these ideas of, you know, solution processable materials or, you know, 
uh, different optoelectronic devices are exciting. And then the next opportunity is perhaps also in thinking about these as very nice packages uh, for quantum information science, where you know that you've packaged all the key characteristics that you want, for example, in a particle that could be five or 10 nanometers in diameter. Anyway, with that, um, I just want to uh, finish probably most importantly with uh, wishing iCanix a happy 100th. It's been an honor to get to participate today. And I really want to, you know, thank our hosts and moderators and who really, you know, created this platform for the community. So, so Alice, Paul, Lan, Martin, thank you guys so much. Uh, it's been, I think, a, a valuable and, and wonderful experience for the community, even through times that were not so easy that really brought us together um, and to share our science, which I think is one of the things we all have most fun uh, in doing. So with that, I'll stop and I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, so thank you, Carrie. That's a wonderful talk. Yeah, very great. We are so happy to have you here for the 100 you know, uh, celebration. So actually that time we think about who will be the most lucky one. <laughs> I feel very lucky. Yeah. I so, feel very lucky. Yeah, Chair, uh, you are. So, uh, yeah, we are so glad because today was our 100th you know, uh, celebration. So, we extend the program to 100 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, you yeah, have more minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah, to do. So, okay, I'll be yeah. <laughs> Let's welcome our uh, panelists. Okay. Yeah, I think most of our waiting online here. Yeah, uh, so today we have, uh, you know, 10 people. Yeah, so perfect people, so five boys, five girls, uh, including my colleagues, Martin and Len, and also other panelists from different places. First is Christian, was uh, from uh, University of Twente, Netherlands, so the Holland. So welcome, uh, Christian. And uh, there is Yuri Gokatish, is uh, our great friend, yeah, our great uh, speakers, so from Dresler University. Yuri, welcome. And uh, we have Nick Fang uh, from MIT, uh, a long time supporter, and also we do many things together, Professor Fang, welcome. And we have Miso, uh, okay, yeah, everyone know Miso, uh, I can ask for sure. Yeah, so Miso now from SKKU, Korea, yeah, he's the most popular speakers and uh, yeah, a lot of things um, I can ask. So Miso, welcome. And we have uh, Christine. Uh, from the Texas Tech University as a, a newcomer. <laughs> yeah. uh, as today for the questions goes to Professor Carey. So you should waiting for yeah Christine's questions. Uh, we also have Chuan Jin Zhao as a, a postdoc from Stanford University. Uh, yeah, he's stayed with us for more than two years. Almost all these hundred you know uh volumes uh, weeks. So Chuan Jin always there. So welcome Chuan Jin. Uh, so now welcome everyone get on the stage. Carrie, we will get to the question part. So I think you will have more questions. Yeah, so Martin, could you please go ahead to share this? Sure. <clears throat> All right, so thank you very much, uh, Sherry Kagan, for the wonderful talk. It's a great pleasure. So uh, we're going to start uh, with our uh, next challenger. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, uh, go ahead. Um, Absolutely. Thanks, Martin. And uh, thanks uh, so much, Professor Kikin, for such a wonderful talk. I used to work with the Chronodos for my undergrad, and uh, this all brings me back to, to that study. And I want to start with the general question. So I used to use Chronodos for bioimaging, and it's so impressive to learn how they can make devices such as with transistors. I want to know what the advantages for quantum dots for the you know transistors or other electronic devices versus in other uh, semiconductors such as uh, metal oxide, you know, carbon nanotube, or even organic uh, semiconductors, and for applications and such as circuits, uh, you showed during the talk. Well, thank you very much, Chen for the application for the question. That's uh, great to hear that you worked on quantum dots there. Um, so, I really, I think you ask a very important question that we should always ask: is why these materials, um, and what's the opportunity that you have from these materials? or you should work on something else, right? Um, and so I'll say that in looking at them for the applicant for transistors, I would say there are a couple things. So as we look at the uh, platforms, I think that there are some opportunities in fabrication that come from these materials. You can really coat them uh, over large areas. You know, you don't have to worry about, you know, alignment in the tube arrays or open areas or 
contacting them. So I think it, de it depends. I think that, um, uh, so I think that, you know, for us, it was interesting to show that they were a competitive class that you could easily fabricate by coding techniques. I think that um, we also, uh, you know, honestly say that as we look at it, it's also an opportunity where uh, we think about, you know, it, I mean, there's a fundamental platform of us understanding them where they're also used for optoelectronic devices, right? And there you also take advantage of the size dependent uh, uh, characteristics, whether that's for their absorption or, or luminescence. So I think about those in, in, in twofold, the way that you ask uh, that question. Um, uh, and uh, I, you know, I think that as we look at different platforms, having something with mobilities that are, you know, 30, 40, maybe even higher. Our colleagues, uh, uh, my colleague and friend Dimitri Talapin has shown, you know, with enough annealing, you could convert it into a polycrystalline film, and now it's even much higher, right? And so the question is, is really thinking about, you know, uh, you know, there are some opportunities that I think that we have in controlling their, you know, composition, doping, and fabrication that really give, may offer us some things that are different. And, you know, maybe it's the flip side of when we think about unconventional, it's not just, you know, you know, a flexible electronic platform, but it does have discrete electronic state. So I still have as a interesting, you know, target, what I think is interesting to me target, which is, you know, is there an opportunity for us to continue, you know, to sort of balance um, the, uh, the coupling between them and to use those discrete states as a way to build other kinds of devices other than ones that we think about that look like a conventional transistor, right? Where we control the occupancy of those discrete states. So I think there are still opportunities for us to explore in the community that way. Thank you so much. Very Thank nice. You. We can move to Christine. Yeah. Christine. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Sherry. Really nice talk. Um, I'm going to go with a little bit more of a broader question just to, to see what you have to say. And so, uh, you know, looking back on your career kind of as you know, as a student and as an early career researcher, I'm thinking there's probably times you took either a risk or you made a really key decision that kind of changed your path or really affected your path. Um, so maybe it was choosing your postdoc or, you know, taking a risk on a project that was sort of, you know, not sure if this was going to pan out well or not sure if it would be successful. Um, and I was just wondering if you think back to any of those key times, if you had advice for students or for early career researchers, um, you know, take this risk or, you know, choose a field that you're, you know, that's different, just something like that that you could comment on. Yeah, so I think, well, you know, I could think of a handful of examples from, you know, really thinking about sort of an obvious one that many people take of sort of mixing it up a little bit to learn something new as a as a postdoc, perhaps one of the ones which makes my career a little bit different than the path that others have taken is that I actually went to industry first. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to blatantly say I would not recommend that to anyone who wants to pursue an academic career afterwards. I think that the landscape has changed for that. So I don't recommend it for my own students. But it was one where, um, you know, I really enjoyed my time. So I worked mm -hmm. at IBM. I worked at Bell Labs as a postdoc, but then I worked at IBM for eight and a half years. And I, I really enjoyed my time there, but I think the, the one where you probably say we really mixed it up is that I always wanted the opportunity to, I, I enjoyed working with uh, students and really thinking broadly about how do we, how could, you know, the work I could do really make an impact uh, more broadly. And so, you know, more broadly than, you know, IBM's, you know, directions and portfolio at the time, and frankly, thinking about the longevity of my career. And so that's, you know, that's, um, that's a bigger change where you say, hmm, life is really good here. I'm going to mix it up and, uh, and go back to, to academia. Um, and my only reason for suggesting that, you know, it's not, um, you know, you have to have this record in, in academia for right or wrong to, to continue in, the, you know, in this in path of get, getting a job. And it's often harder later in your career to say, do I want to go back as a junior faculty member? And I was in the fortunate position that I didn't have to start as a junior faculty member, which was uh, was nice at that at stage of life. But I think it's harder to do. But I really think about you know the opportunities and, and risks that it is important uh, to take risks. But also, I would say one of the biggest advice that I would give is you are never too old, mature, wise to never ask for a mentor. And so I would say you know always feel that wherever you go, even if you you know. Um, 
you know, even if you're well established, if you start to do something new, right, uh, new could mean in your science or new could mean in, you know, taking on a different role, you know, uh, it's new, you know, you know, you're not, do you really want to reinvent the wheel, right? You can go and ask. So when I moved to academia, I didn't move as a junior person. No one would have suggested I'd have a, a mentor, but I did go and ask the faculty member uh, to serve as, as a uh, mentor. And Yuri will know Jack Fisher. That's who I asked. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that just makes, you know, you can learn so much. And um, that's one of the things is that as you take different steps in your career, always feel that you, you know, it's a, it's not a, it's a, it's a good thing to, to feel that you can seek advice. And so that's probably what I would, you know, perhaps the, the best piece of advice that I, I think I could give. Perfect. Wow. Thank Love you. you. <laughs> Very interesting. Hi, Yuri. Uh, could you give some comments from a superstar, you know, as a, a man? <laughs> I think Cherry was a, you know, the best of female stars. <laughs> Um, I can give some comments, uh, probably, first of all, as a scientist and also as uh, one of the first uh, I can ex uh, speakers. I think Paul Weiss and I were in a session on the 7th of May uh, mm -hmm. 2020, just like a, a two months after uh, our university uh, got closed because of the pandemic here. And at that time, uh, Iconex talks were just on a single platform. We were still uh, impressed by uh, thousands of people uh, who were able to listen to the presentation more than I would ever uh, see in a single room, even giving a plenary lecture uh, for a major event. So it became clear that this format has a potential and probably really one of very few things that uh, pandemic uh, brought us on the positive side uh, was this opportunity to speak to people around the world. Mm -hmm. And a uh, couple of months later, ICANX uh, uh, went to multiple uh, platforms, became accessible to many more people. And when I was giving my talk uh, a year later, uh, there were larger numbers. And I think the largest talk uh, uh, brought more than a half a million uh, viewers uh, uh, in the program. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Alice here. So I think uh, it's a really celebrating science and scientists. Not only a couple of movie stars uh, who filed for a divorce and uh, uh, much of the world was following what was happening, the defamation suit over the past couple of months, not only sporting events, uh, but also science can be a star. Science can attract attention of uh, hundreds of thousands of people at a time. And also what it means that when this thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of scientists all over the world learn about the latest advances in materials, nanotechnology, medicine field. It means that they will accelerate their research. They have access to this latest information to brains of uh, great speakers, uh, like for example, Sherry Kagan, who was presenting today. And this will accelerate development of science worldwide, also flatten the field, allowing people who are far away from major uh, science centers uh, learn about what's going on, what is the latest, what is the hottest, what are ideas uh, that top scientists presenting in this series uh, have. And I think uh, this ICANX series will have a lasting impact on science in general, in a way also we communicate science. So really, Alice, thank you very much for launching it. And of course, big thanks to all speakers who presented, uh, all the moderators. I must say, I enjoyed many talks in this series myself and strongly encourage my students to listen to talk even far outside their direct uh, area of research here. So again, thank you. So you're you're exactly right. I remember you uh get uh, I I I can act in the third week. So you together with Paul, 
So that time I will also ask the same questions and uh, uh, so both you and Paul and other professors try, you know, help to not only provide the latest result, also try to help to get more young scientists and young students, you know, yeah, to build up the career. So that's very important. I think after, you know, two more years, we really, you know, done a lot, much more than our imagination. Thank you very much. You are, uh, I think you are few of them who gave the uh, talks twice, right? Yeah. <laughs> not exactly, because, uh, you know, not, then it's really hard to get on the stage twice. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, oh. so thank you, Yuri. Yeah. Very great. Well, I must also add that I truly enjoyed also serving on the young scientist panel. That was also <laughs> a wonderful experience and also younger uh, up and rising uh, star researchers got a chance to speak in this series. And that was really great. Did you remember who is in the young scientist star the first week for the rising star? So, Miso. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Miso, I did you remember? remember? You got the email, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I remember the day I, I checked my email and then I woke up at some point at four a.m. I don't know I, I I don't know why still, and then I saw Paul Vice's name in my email inbox, and then I know him because he's very famous worldwide, and then I didn't understand why he sent an email to me, and then the title was like. ACS Nano Iconex Rising Star. So I was like, what's going on here? And it, it was 4 a.m. for me. And I'm a late sleeper, so I don't usually wake up at the time. But at the moment, probably I felt something. So I still remember the moment I checked the email and I couldn't go back to sleep. So I think it was a like for me personally, like this Iconex talks, as Yuri uh, said. Like there was a, a number of audiences I've never seen before and after actually. So I had a chance to give my presentation on my beloved topic, metamaterials based energy harvesting. And I got, I, I, I became the first cohort, one of the first cohort of the ACS Nano Rising Star. I can not still believe it. I think that energy gave me like the chance to make a big transition from the, uh, my previous institute to my uh, like a current one, the Sungyungan University. So yeah, so I used to be young at that moment, like two years ago, <laughs> I was a, <laughs> I was a ACS and a rising star. And now I think I'm, yeah, I, I don't think I, I will be selected as a rising star anymore, but <laughs> maybe later something else. <laughs> so You really write it up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I need to work harder, but anyway. So this is for me personally, it's a life-changing experience. And then I'm I really, really appreciate everything you did, like Alice and everybody. And then every Friday, it's my like a ritual now. So I have to study for something on Friday night. Otherwise, I feel so guilty now. So that's <laughs> very weird one. And then thank you so much because I when I uh, serve as a moderator. I learn more than I speak when, when I give my own presentation because all of talks are so inspiring. So every week I get motivated and I'm, I'm encouraged more and more. So this is just such an amazing platform and thank you everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so Miso, you know, your day was uh, Yuri and the Paul made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they pick up okay miso is the right one yeah this is very very great yeah then we have the rising star you know yeah uh martin you also the rising star right yeah i i came in as a as again as miso said it was a very sweet nice surprise at first i had no idea what paul is trying to tell me I so, <laughs> so I you jack your paper <laughs> I said, oh, wow, this, this is interesting. And uh, it, it, it was also interesting because it was at the same time I got a paper, one of my, my first paper accepted in ACS Nano. So I thought it was about the paper. Then I started reading it and it's about uh, ACS Nano Rising Star. And it was the, a platform uh, in my career where I had um, an amazing audience. And 
for the first time, some of my uh, relatives in Africa could actually watch my talk. They had no idea what I was talking about. But my brother was like, oh, yeah, now you're famous. I can see you. And I was like, what, <laughs> what do you mean? I'm not famous. And then uh, after that, what has happened is um, uh, the, the platform has started bringing scientists who normally we just meet every two years at the Africa MRS. And we're having conversations and I can point to them topics and they can point me to things that are happening on the platform that normally they would have zero chance of, uh, of, of listening to. Uh, we have, um, I have a good friend, uh, Alice, you've talked to, to him a few times now, Bala, who is also uh, a young scientist at WODI, uh, the ICANX, who is very engaged and is mobilizing a lot of material scientists in Africa to start participating uh, at the global stage. And what this platform has done to that part of the world is started, uh, giving people a kind of a, a mirror to see what they are doing is actually mm -hmm. what the rest of the world are doing. I was uh, very surprised to see the kind of nano science that is happening in the continent that normally would I would never get to learn. Uh, but because people are seeing what is uh, being presented here for free, they're like, oh, that looks like my work. And then uh, you get an email that says, hey, Martin, this, this, this is looking interesting. And, and we are starting now to encourage them to actually participate uh, at bigger stages. Um, a, a, a very good young um, uh, scientist uh, from uh, Mauritius, for example, who was in the Rose uh, event, uh, very hardworking, very brilliant scientist. And when she sees something interesting on the ICANX, she will uh, reach out and be like, oh, that sounds like uh, what we're doing. And I'm like, yep, science is universal. So the, the platform has really opened up uh, people who sometimes may not feel like they belong on the global stage, but because they can see what the world is doing, they can actually uh, realize that they are participating on a bigger stage than, uh, than they, they think. And so I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity, Aris and uh, everyone. And uh, as we continue to do this, I hope that uh, we will bring more people from uh, all corners of the world to participate at the global stage. So thank you. Okay, yes, it is. So, Barty, you are the rising stars of first year. Then you help us, you know, organize so many events. And uh, yeah, that's really, really great. Actually, for the rising stars, for the young scientists, a lot of people really, you know, try to help. And uh, many, many people from different areas was to jump in. I think, you know, last year you were served as a young scientist, you know, award, right? Yeah, you also have a you know, try to chair the sessions and do a lot of things. Uh, how did you feel for uh, ICANX? Well, I have to say, I, I of course heard about it um, from the beginning and I know it's uh, very successful. So when the opportunity comes, um, Jack, did you talk to me about, you know, join the team? Um, though I was, you know, quite excited, but also a bit hesitant because it's Friday night, right? It's quite late <laughs> for me. Normally that's the time I really want to relax. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> since taking the opportunity, um, I found, you know, I really enjoyed it because every talk is so, you know, it's really wonderful. And as Miso said, you learn a lot. Um, I really feel like I, I've, since joining, I've learned a lot of new things. And also, especially working with, uh, you know, a wonderful team and to be able to um, not only connect to many more people, and also I, I also agree with um, Yuri, this, this is such a great platform that reach out to people, a broad community. For a lot of people actually may not have the opportunity to uh, get access to the, you know, the top class public labs and um, research funding and all this, but they have this opportunity during this um, pandemic time where face-to-face -face interaction become so challenging and this just give people a lot of opportunity to see top class um, science and scientists um, to learn about research. So I'm really also feel great honor to be part of the team and look forward to um, to see next hundred I can next talk. <laughs> <laughs> and also I if, if allow me I actually want to ask Sherry a question. Sure. <laughs> <because> I, <really laughs> <enjoyed it. laughs> I just want to ask, I, I feel I'm really impressed by the way you actually could um, make that, uh, you know, array of nano diamond particles using the caterpillar effect. 
So I would like to know, uh, is there any, uh, what is the size sort of um, the range that you can actually do this, um, you know, array alignment? Yeah, so the, the example of the nanodiamond particles are nominally 40 nanometers, I think we've measured 36 point something. Uh, but uh, so we those are the size of the particles that we've used currently. We've also done this with other sizes and shapes of particles. So we've done this with uh, colloidal gold particles. We've made like oligomers of them where we control the number that we have. We've put gold particles next to upconverting phosphors. So we could make a, we put a rod next to, um, it's not a sphere, but it's a, you know, a shaped particle. And so you can actually make those templates so that you have some size and shape control. So I'd say that we probably haven't gone smaller yet than the sort of, you know, let me say 40 nanometers in terms of the size of the particle. But it, that is one of the things that we're currently working on is uh, our ways to, um, unfortunately, Brownian motion starts to come and get you, right? And then, and so it makes it it makes it harder. But we are working on, you know, schemes that would allow us to uh, position particles that were, let me say, or the part of part of the particle that's interesting would actually be smaller. So we're trying to push down in those directions to, and there's been some nice work on other uh, uh, approaches um, to actually make particles that go in templates. Um, nice work out of um, Singapore on, on sort of positioning 10 nanometer gold particles. So I think we'll see, you know, that you'll be, you know, uh, that you, you know, that you can, you can do this. Um, and the question is, is with uh, what yield and what, what complexity. So putting a single particle in a template is actually pretty high yield that you can do this. And, you know, uh, but uh, as we make bigger oligomers, it gets, uh, it gets uh, you know, the, the, the um, efficiency drops off. But that's something we're, you know, very interested in, in a community that also, uh, you know, I think, you know, folks like Heiko Wolf have really uh, developed and, you know, we've learned from. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you very much for that. Thank um, you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, aside sorry. the talk, you know, you can, uh, anytime you can ask questions. <laughs> okay. So, Christian, did you have any scientific questions? Yeah, of course. It was such a fantastic <laughs> talk. So, of course. Um, very curious now and, and learned a lot. Um, you already mentioned that uh, you're very excited about these particles because they have uh, uh, very interesting properties because they are so small and everything is confined. But all the devices I have seen, you have yeah layers, have multiple layers. So that gives me the impression that you would maybe average out all these exciting uh, properties of a single particle. So uh you plan to go very small and make maybe even eventually devices just existing of uh one nanoparticle uh or would the future be yes i reached to your expertise right but um, uh <laughs> yeah so well, the one thing is that you don't wash out everything right that mm -hmm. as you look at even ensembles of particles you still maintain those you can maintain those sort of quantum confined states right so, you know in terms of how much variability there is compared to the energy separation that you have between some of those states. So you don't wash everything out. Um, you know, I'll say that the community, of course, uh, uh, and the people who are better at synthesis than, than me are certainly working on how do you make more molecular like, uh, you know, right now we have three to 5% size distribution that's largely responsible for the inhomogeneities. Uh, so people continue to work on, you know, in the field on how to improve this. But even now, you know, the uh, even on in ensembles, you have characteristics of the individual particles that can contribute. And the question is, is well, where is that? One of the nice things is that you can tune, right? How close and how much they couple. And so you can sort of, you know, what becomes a characteristic of the larger ensemble? What's characteristic of the individual particle? I think we get to do that with some control. Um, but so I think there are lots of examples where you want to make ensemble devices, but I think to your point, you also have opportunities to make sort of single particle devices. You know, there's, there has been research in trying to wire up one particle, even that goes back to, you know, many years ago where Paul McEwen and, and uh, Paul Alvisadas did. Um, but I think that uh, as we look at opportunities, um, you know, that what drives that, you know, some of the opportunities I think in quantum information science in particular will, will uh, drive us back again into the direction of not just using 
single particles to understand their characteristics. There's beautiful work by the community on that I didn't talk about on, you know, on single particle spectroscopies and, and electrical measurements. But I think that, um, you know, I think there'll be some forces, right, that from as you think about now beyond the science, are they interesting for applications? I think we'll start to, you know, we're seeing more of that as we look to the application in particular for quantum information science. Yeah, that's very interesting. And um, sometimes in ensemble effects, you can have maybe also uh, certain properties you which that maybe get even enhanced or amplified by the ensemble. Uh, do you think those kind of properties could also be exploited uh, in your devices? Yeah, I think there are. I think that there are. So I say, what do I, um, you know, I think that there are opportunities as we think about controlling um, charge or if we look at ensembles where you can mix materials that's one of the things that i didn't talk about today that i think is really interesting is that we look at mixtures of materials i have to admit we've done that a little bit more on our many materials work than we have on the semiconductor work um but you can mix you know semiconductors metals magnets plasmonic materials that enhance luminescence you could you know if you think about what the you know the opportunities to enhance you know one of the things that uh, we really like is how do you, and it's actually a topic of one of our MIRI grants, but how do you mix properties that are, often you don't find in a material, right? If I take a bulk material, how many times does it give me, you know, something that's magnetic and semiconductor? Well, there are challenges in like magnetic semiconductors, right? That maybe we could address through the use of particles. Same thing is true. We've mixed, you know, plasmonic materials and magnetic materials. And now we combine functions in one effectively at the next length scale homogenized materials that you're right is a product of the ensemble. And so I think that's a very exciting uh, opportunity that could lead us into, you know, very different directions uh, that, you know, push us beyond what we think about as conventional devices that we know, but where we might be able to mix materials properties that really are a product of the ensemble. Yeah, no, thanks a lot for your answers. I'm really looking forward to seeing more coming out of your lab. Okay, really? thank you, Christy. Yeah, so very much because you are, yeah, we, we really great to have your help. You know, it's really hard for me to find someone from Europe. Yeah, so we have many Europe speakers, you know, we need someone active in Europe, you know, to be help get on the stage. So, yeah, Christy was really help a lot. And uh, last week, right, or the week before last week, you are in Israel, right? Yeah, you cheer the sessions in the hotel, so that's very nice. <laughs> Working really hard, you know. Yeah. Thank you so much. I I keep you, you know, in last for me class questions, uh, because yeah. Uh, first go to Nick. You know, Nick, what kind of recorder you keep on IKX? As for the most audience, yeah. The one session you get on the stage was May 8, right? Yeah, so 2020, May 8 is the first session after your session. So we change the platform, go to Baidu. So that week we have over half a million. Yeah, so you know how many people were, you know, already viewed your talk? Yeah, so. 750, you know, thousand. <laughs> Close to, yeah, yeah, one quarter to million. So that's one of the quarter. So, Nick, so you'll be famous. <laughs> Thank you, Alice, uh, and all uh, organizers of uh, ICANX. Um, yeah, I, I will say that uh, uh, yeah, I'm very fortunate to become uh, one of the uh, guest speakers of uh, ICANX series. and. Uh, um, I would thank uh, Yuri, uh, Paul, Alice, who set the stage and uh, raised the expectation. Um, and uh, I also uh, find uh, uh, you know, really uh, a great opportunity to interact with uh, the young scientists, uh, uh, writing stars. I feel that uh, uh, you know, because of uh, all this uh, inspiring and thought-provoking talks, you know, I kind of uh, you know, uh, gain a lot of new inspirations. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, I've been working with Alice uh, for uh, some of the uh, in-person events before. I can uh, events uh, uh, that are really promoting scientific outreach and uh, uh, innovation. 
uh, and I feel that uh, uh, over the past two years, uh, uh, it is really because of ICANX, uh, we can stay connected and uh, uh, you know, bring um, scientific uh, and uh, uh, I'll say uh, uh, you know, international interdisciplinary talks to everyone who uh, really are uh, interested and uh, uh, excited of pursuing scientific research. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Nick, you know, yeah, so you are the first week we changed the platform, so that they really, really lucky day. So Yuri was one week ahead. So, <laughs> you know, the first time I'll see you with the third week, so it's just one week ahead. Uh, after you, it's many people get out. You know, Gang Chen, yeah, was very interesting. He checked with me for the numbers. Alice, are you serious? Yeah, we have uh, 200,000 people listen to my talk. I say, okay, yeah, so for next talk, it's a triple. <laughs> it's a triple the numbers, the jury of you, yeah. Uh, it's very nice, but I see, you know, we invited the best scientists. Yeah, they deliver the best talk. So that's how we got many, many people's, you know, sticker with I can X. Uh, but we also have many, many, many people to support us. And many young scientists support us. Chuan Zhen. Yeah. Chuan Zhen, you know, yeah, on this stage, I'm the oldest one, you know, maybe the longest one, but you are the second. Why? Because Paul and uh, Yuri was the third week on this I can access stage to deliver talk. So Chuan Zhen that time was Paul's PhD, and he can speak Chinese. Yeah, he is very, very warm heart to help. So since that week, Chuan Zhen and me, every week, change emails. They help us, you know, transfer the emails. Sometimes the file is too big, so Chuan Zhen will do the deliver. And the Chuan Zhen also had to be the first challenges. So Chuan Zhen, how do you feel? So for these hundred weeks? <laughs> well, thank you, Alex. I think it's really my privilege to to you know, serve for the ICANX. At the beginning, as you know, this two years ago, I was still I was a kid. I'm still a kid, but. Uh, you know, I was a grad student with Paul, <laughs> and uh, to us, it's really an honor to serve with you and uh, the board to listen to the talks and help to connect. I guess, you know, it's an advantage to speak two languages and also be a grad student with Paul, so I can help from the beginning. And not only to listen, I think I can provide the, the opportunity for Yansan to get on the stage like mm -hmm. myself as a ex challenger and to you know you get involved with the talk and talk to the top scientists to learn the field the direction and also a lot of uh, career advices from those top scientists those are very important and helpful to you know young scientists to learn you know what i want to do in the future you know what are the challenges and opportunities uh, in this field so i feel very lucky and the privilege to, to you know serve and help and think i'm going to continue serving uh, with you and i can act so for for the next 100 as uh, as missing, <laughs> missing, you know, in the future, yeah. Yeah, what well, depends you. on you. So I give you a last chance to promote the Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm the guy behind the Twitter account, by the way, so. Yeah. Oh, very nice. <laughs> yeah, so that's Chuan Zhen every week, you know, yeah, providing information, the figures, so I, I couldn't, you know, uh, get engaged with the Twitter, I couldn't get engaged with YouTube, so that's all Chuan Zhen's job, so thank you very much, Chuan Zhen, you really, really did a lot of things, yeah, we appreciate it. <laughs> so that's a hundred, depends on you, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, so I think time fly, yeah. 100 minutes, yeah? So, Karen, I promise to you, 100 minutes, okay. Yeah, so thank you everyone. Yeah, this was a very nice, you know, 100 celebrations. We're hoping for the next 100, the next 200 or 1,000. I think all the people working together can make everything happen. So, yeah, uh, we need to move. Yeah, so I, uh, I will do the following things. Yeah, first I try to, uh, okay, sorry, yeah. Uh, Terry, yeah, this is uh, 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 the certification for ICANX, yeah, given to the speakers. We are so proud we have you as a uh, hundred, you know, the most lucky people, <laughs> uh, person. Yeah, so Terry, is yours. Thank you very much. It's an honor, I have to say. Thank you very much, uh, 
Alice and everyone else who's here. It's an honor to be able to. Uh, okay. Be number yeah. one, 100. And I uh, just want to thank everybody for, for their involvement and for everyone who's made uh, really this possible for the, the community. It's a, it's a really a wonderful contribution. Thank you. Yeah, I hope to see you in person in the near future. Yeah. So yeah, next we have some surprise as at we begin. I see that. Okay. So we welcome Mesa Key. Yeah, Mesa. Now I give you the official warm welcome to join the team. Okay, to be our moderator to help in the future. So Mesa, oh. <laughs> I know you have a lot. No tears. I say that. <laughs> no tears. I thought, uh, yeah, I I thought I already got hired as a moderator forever. So, yeah, no tears. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, me so yeah, we keep on going. Yeah, we will to get more and more people help. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We are okay, uh, welcome you. our next one. So Christian, are you still there? Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. Actually, we really are looking forward to someone from Europe because now we have many, many scientists from Europe to get on the stage. So we need someone to help. So Christian, thank you very much. Welcome it will be a great team. honor. It will be a pleasure. I think this platform is just fantastic. And I can only echo everything that has, uh, has been already said. And I will be glad uh, uh, to help you guys to get more exposure uh, here in Europe. I already do my best here at the university and in a small country like the Netherlands, but I hope very fast that we will get people from all over Europe also contributing on every Friday evening lecture. Uh, so it will be great. I'm very much looking forward uh, yeah, to work with you guys, okay. to continue to no work small with country, you. Uh, I can ask or connect. Yeah, <laughs> science <laughs> connect to everyone, connect the universe. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, welcome to join the team. Now we have six people yeah, in the team. So in the future, you will see all these people from different parts of the world. Yeah, we're going to you know, get IKX to move to the next 100,000. OK, yeah, let's keep on going. Thank you, all of you. And uh, this, week, uh, this month, we have a cherry first. Yeah, next week uh, we will have Alpha. Uh, next week uh, we'll have Chao Yang, and then we have Yuri. Uh, they all from different parts. They will talk about different you know, topics. Next week is more about the metabolics engineering, and uh, next week will be the quantum. Yeah, and then will be the uh photonics. So yeah, this month on the IKX. Yeah, it will be a great month. So welcome to join us and everyone see you every Friday.